hopefully, you know, like a, a story that I'm telling, wake up some people and then, you know, they want to uh, do the same thing and follow, and that will make a huge difference in the rest of their life, you know. If they're 50, you know, they have to understand they're half dead, and the other half, they want to make it as comfortable, as, as healthy as possible. And that's possible these days. It's a youth culture. Welcome to Honoring Our Elders, where we take a deeper look at lives well lived. A program where we look at aging gracefully and the deeper value behind honoring our elders. Talking Stick Vid is a new venture I'm involved with with a very good friend of mine and colleague, Frank Melly. We met and work in a New York City television station and have been involved in some really rewarding projects. When I think of my background, I can't help but think of my family. I think of my father and my uncles that um, are considered a part of rock and roll history. And that's a large part of who I am. And Frank, Frank has been involved in hundreds of environmental programs. Most recently, Meet the Farmer TV, that is currently broadcasting nationally. When Frank first came to me and was asking me, what could we do? What kind of, song, what kind of story could we do? Well, I figured, first I have to look at what's important to me. And one of the things that's important to me is a belief in family, a belief in history, a belief that everyone has a story. Now, there was a day, and it was a very sad day, and Frank had invited me to attend the wake of his mother. Now during this wake, there was a video that he had done, I'm not sure how long ago, but it was maybe a year or two before his mom had passed. And she talked about growing up as a young girl. She talked about her family. She talked about her children. And while I watched this video, other family members would come through and they would sit and they would watch. There was something really special that happens only when, you, when you're able to appreciate again someone that you love, someone that you missed and someone that you're able to, to now see again. Well, it just, it just stayed with me. And so when Frank said, well, what could we do? I said, well, I'll tell you one thing, man. That video you did of your mom, that's important. I think everyone should have a video like that. Everyone should be able to save a piece of someone who's important to them. That's a little bit of what we're trying to do. So when I think of what is lives well lived, as I said, everyone has a story. You don't have to be a superstar. You don't have to be the president. But your life means something. And as long as we're around and we've got a camera and you want to listen, we'll tell your story. Okay, I think about two and a half years ago, uh, we took the first film. And then shortly after that, uh, this stroke happened to me, totally unexpected. You know, I, I've never been sick, I've never been a patient, so now I'm on the other side. And uh, I look at the doctors, like patients looking at them. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm okay. I, I feel oh, yeah. sorry for you, really. No, I'm okay. You're, you're <laughs> don't, time. don't worry. Your legs just been doing a lot of, a lot of work today, so. Oh, oh, no, no, no problem. All right. We're going to the oxygen chamber and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's my nap time. Pull your feet up. There you go. Good. However, my father, my grandfather also had a stroke, and I had a premonition that I may have the same thing. 
And then came shortly after he finished, ironically, you know, he is a guy totally healthy and uh, good shape. And I demonstrated that to you. Uh, but uh, suddenly this came and I had to be hospitalized for two months or so. And then I started the physical therapy and then that continued as an outpatient. So I had to really change my uh, course of my life, what to do and stop working and uh, or perhaps just enjoy life. <laughs> but anyway, these two years has been very eye-opening. Well, let me tell you what uh, I had as a treatment uh, so far, uh, two and a half years or so. Uh, as a physician, I, I knew uh, regular protocol for the stroke, but uh, I wanted to try everything available to me. Uh, somewhat expensive, but uh, there's a time to spend money. <laughs> um, there are about five or six of them available. Usually, mainstream doctor recommends neurologist. He examines you and he decides which hospital to go. Fortunately, um, there's a rehabilitation center near here, 10 minutes away. So I went to regular hospital for overnight and the next day they transferred me to Helen Hayes Hospital, which is a New York State Rehabilitation Hospital. And I remained there, I think, about two months, uh, inpatient uh, physical therapy and uh, anything else that I had, but then basically no other treatment. And then I knew about this, uh, the treatment with a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. This is the chamber. Mm. So it's like going back in the womb, huh? <laughs> Barometric pressure, right? Hmm. I should cut my head off. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Okay, watch your head. There you go. Oh, Baby again. <laughs> Here we go. I come out a stillborn. <laughs> well, Betty, you come out twins. Ready? <laughs> Boy and girl. Okay, one, two, and three. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think it's I'm like this. Okay. He had to pack his mask now? Well, he get in. Yes, I'm going to adjust you. I started to have um, oxygen therapy. Uh, some of you may know that the um, caisson disease. Caisson disease is uh, when you diving in deep water suddenly come up. And uh, because of the difference in, difference in pressure, the 
air comes out of the um, uh, blood and then that can cause what we call uh, bubble, air bubble, um, uh, stroke kind of thing. So if it clogs the artery completely, there's no blood supply beyond that point. So uh, you have to, of course, be careful how to use it. But anyway, uh, this is uh, recommended by the government insurance company for case of disease who have uh, trouble breathing, couldn't, can't get enough oxygen. But um, it's also good for burn. When you have a second degree or third degree burn, second degree, third degree burn, then uh, you can uh, uh, exp expedite the healing. So those two uh, well recognized, so the insurance company will pay, Medicare, uh, they're happy to pay. However, uh, this usage for stroke is not recognized. Uh, so I had to, of course, pay out of my pocket and I think I did about 10 or 15 or so. Uh, but the effect of this is not as good as I wanted to be. No. If I die, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> now he gets a blanket. <laughs> oh my God, that's, that's like a... Uh, the You can see him through the window if you want. That might be a good shot. Can you see me? Okay. That's great. This is very interesting. <laughs> Ooh. Amazing. We want to make sure he gets a full technical description so he can explain later for our viewers how this works. Yeah. <laughs> if he doesn't know already, he probably does, right? Yeah, he's going to pressure 2.0 mm -hmm. and he's doing wonderful. After his second dive already, he was starting to move his right side, starting to move his right arm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I can see him in the chamber from not being able to lift it at all and he's lifting his arm. Oh, wow. This is wonderful. He's an amazing, amazing man. And what's the, the name of this therapy? What's it called? This is hyperbaric oxygen treatment. He's really wonderful. Blow me away, but today with him walking. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Right. He, he amazes me. He's really and uh, stem cell. Uh, so then I started also um, IV stem cell. Stem cell technique is they remove some blood from you and then go to the laboratory. This, this one is in California. And then they make uh, uh, stem cell just uh, from the, my own blood. They make a stem cell treatment stem cell for myself. And uh, it was expensive, like a thousand dollars a pop, you know. But uh, I did that three times and uh, I didn't see much difference, so I dropped it. And then uh, one doctor's office was uh, experimenting with the magnesium treatment. I did like a five times, and there's no effect. And then a couple of other things, uh, uh, high, high oxygen and a few other things, they're minor, and I tried it, but then there's no effect, so I quit. So all that 
uh, things that I've done, only thing really works is old-fashioned uh, physical therapy and maybe occupational therapy. Occupational therapy, the name is funny, but uh, occupation, that means you, you are doing things during the day, even cooking or whatever. They, they teach the patients, you know, uh, daily activities. So those two are the best ones. It's, you have to be patient and uh, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't rush. And uh, no, they say usually take about a year and a half uh, to get mo most of the benefit. After a year and a half, uh, healing slows down. And uh, I, I'm, with, I'm, I'm at that point now. So I had a treatment for a year and a half, it was a good pace recovery, but now I'm into the uh, pretty much a plateau. And occasionally I, I feel something that uh, I didn't do before, but now I can. But uh, I'm too impatient to, <laughs> uh, to continue this. But then uh, uh, physical therapy, I basically stopped and uh, I'm just uh, working out. It's exercise, went back to old uh, gym, uh, work out uh, sports club, and I try to go there two or three times a week, you know. Basically to strengthen arm and uh, leg, my right side is affected, so I'm trying to bring them back to this strength. Yeah, I was of course hoping for 100% recovery and make a film and then show you, you know, 100% uh, health, put stroke and 100% recovery, but <laughs> it doesn't go that way. Uh, I bet some person like my father had a similar situation. He had a minor stroke and then two weeks later completely recovered. I was hoping that would happen, but that didn't. So um, if one can have a close to 100% uh, recovery, that's a very good. But in my case, I would say the first half a year was very good, maybe good 50% recovered. And after that, slowly I recovered. Right now, maybe I'm maybe 60% or so. Was, not quite 70, because I cannot run. Of course, uh, no more tennis. Uh, I can walk slowly. You know, with a cane, I can walk better. But uh, without the cane and the brace, which uh, supports my uh, leg, without this, it's a little more difficult. When I went into the hospital, I have a roommate who happened to live here, near here. <clears throat> I thought I was lucky. I was able to talk, I can see, uh, but uh, many of the patients on the same floor had a problem seeing, swallowing, and uh, eating, you know. So it's various degrees. In my case, my right side was affected, but sometimes I have a minor swallowing difficulty. So I keep biting uh, inside the cheek, like this side more than this side. <clears throat> uh, I think what's important at our age of, I'm 79 now, but uh, uh, yeah, 79, don't get in, uh, into the depressive state, because depression is a terrible thing and, uh, you know, when, maybe it's normal, because, you know, after so many years of healthy life, this happens and, you know, I, it may be even easier to think maybe I'll stop trying. 
but um, uh, I do take antidepressant Prozac, 20 milligrams a day. Uh, that I think helps, you know, mood uh, stabilizes a little bit. Um, uh, other than that, as a person, it's very di hard to come to realize th this is it, and you know, I begin to appreciate life more, though, actually, you know, because uh, I could be dead, I could die tomorrow, but then I'm still alive and enjoying all this nature. And <laughs> busy until four years ago so I was always multitasking you know I was always had a three things to do at any time so now I realize I, I really have to slow down and I'm slowing down I can't move fast so whatever I have to do it takes time I have to get there and do this and uh, e even uh, daily living becomes chore because it's uh, if my wife forgot to make dinner or something, I have to open the refrigerator door and somehow make up something. So life in general becomes difficult. However, because of my age, I'm, I can just retire. I, I don't really have activity now, but uh, uh, patients still call me, you know, and, and they try to tell them what to do, what not to do. But um, I could potentially enjoy life more, but then that un uneasy feeling and uh, tension I feel in my, myself, which has gone down quite a bit. So we'll see how it goes. And, I, and uh, I'm at the point that my wife and I are kind of preparing for our death because, you know, it's, it's a, death is a part of life. And, uh, we have to understand that's what's going to happen then. I can't die right now. <laughs> I have to rewrite the will and, you know, that kind of thing. Take care of all these financial things before you go. So that kind of things occupy our mind and trying to uh, take care of uh, this property. We have another rental property. So we don't have to do anything. You know, I'm not the uh, type of person, you know, being braggadocio. Uh, I don't beat my chest and look what I did and this. But uh, I'm happy, quietly, helping somebody who needed. I've done that throughout my life and uh, I was always trying to reach out to people. But, um, well, you know, that said, and I, I don't even remember the name sometimes. Uh, and I think, oh, there was a young man who I help, helped. But uh, he, no normal person doesn't come around and come back and then uh, appreciate your you know, help and this. But anyway, that's fine with me, you know. Well, you just heard what I said, but I think maybe it's important to go back several years ago when I was in the full swing, I was at the peak of my life and a career. Let me take you back into the time what I was talking about and then you understand how I would feel today. My father, dentist, and my two brothers following me, they wanted to become dentists. So my father said, you know, we really cannot use, we have enough dentists, so one, two, three, right? So you do something else. You are above average, smart enough, and you are disciplined, so you go to medical school. That's what happened. My brothers tend to uh, like easy life, 
So it's easy to succeed my father's business, take over, you see. So I think my next brother is smart enough to become uh, MD, but then he just wanted to you know, go to dental school and then take over my father's business. But then I was a little more ambitious and also, and so I ended up in medical school, which was very tough in Japan. It's a highly competitive society. You know. Well, my, my father was well established as a dentist in the community. He was um, very well liked, you know, charming kind of person with a charisma. And uh, we had uh, maybe almost 300,000 people in this city. But he was the only one not drafted during the war. So, you know, they kind of prote protected him. But uh, he did influence definitely my two brothers to go into dentistry to work with them and eventually take over. But then I was kind of left out. <laughs> In Japan, medical school is two, uh, six years. Instead of, uh, most of Americans take eight years, four years of college and four years of uh, graduate study in medicine. But uh, there are several universities here in this country too have a six-year course. But it's, it's uh, very hard, you know, concentrated in six years. And um, so I entered the pre-med and then I wanted to go to the best medical school. So I studied how to get into for the uh, third, fourth, fifth, six, six years, which I did. And in Japan, we have about 100 medical schools and the top two in the Tokyo, um, my university, it's always you know neck and neck kind of thing. Yeah. Well, it's I took my internship. You see, after six years, you have one year of internship, and I had the choice of going to my university hospital or some other place. But then I chose my hometown. There was a United States Naval Hospital, and, uh, which is about half an hour south of Tokyo. And uh, to learn English also. And then I took my internship there and prepared myself to come here. Uh, that was 1958 when I graduated. And uh, this country was really looking for more doctors and nurses. and. There was a preference visa. That's what I came here with. And, um, uh, but then after coming here, spending one year in Queens doing my internship, I wanted to stay because this country really needed and welcoming the doctors. And Japan's future for doctors didn't look very, very bright that time. So I wanted to stay, but then the immigration law required us to go out of the country for two years, you know, whether I go to Europe, uh, you know, Japan, or you know, Canada. So I decided to go to Canada, Montreal, because the postgraduate training there, like a fellowship, was approved by AMA. So I didn't have to waste time, you see. So uh, I went to Montreal, McGill University, and I took uh, basic science pathology. But I liked it. No weekends, no evenings. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of, st I wanted to do ear, nose, and throat, but uh, I kind of stayed there and became a pathologist. And I finished my training at here, Columbia Presbyterian. In 1963, my wife and I immigrated to this country, and then uh, 66, June 66, I finished training. And then uh, since I finished my training at Columbia Presbyterian, a lot of doors opened up for me because it's, you know, it's a top uh, teaching university hospital. And then uh, my wife liked the one just north of New York City, in Nyack, it's half an hour north, and the community hospital pathologist, you know, that's what I did for 20 years, and then uh, I retired from there, and then did a medical examiner's job, and a few other hospitals, and, but uh, at age 
50, that's 26 years ago, I started to have arthritis, you know, pain. And then I saw a rheumatologist, a friend of mine, Al Becker, hey, Al, I have this pain, what to do? He said, oh, that's an aging process. Uh, uh, you l take aspirin, you have to learn to live with it. That's when I started to study alternative medicine, you know, holistic medicine, just to prevent, to take care of myself. Now, after 26 years, I'm in a position to help other people. Okay, so 26 years ago, uh, well, as you know, aging process starts with your reading. You know, you start reading far and far, and then uh, you need uh, reading glasses at the age of 40, typically. And then at age 50, people start having arthritis, you know. So that was the first sign I said, uh, there must be something that I can do to help myself. That's when I went in. When I started to study to help myself and uh, I didn't realize there are people who are on the radio who are writing articles you know about this and I realized how fast this information changed so I have been spending good three hours every day for the last 25 years you know mostly listening by the time anything is printed it's al already obsolete especially textbooks you can't read anymore. You know, it's like five years old and a lot of information in there is uh, not true anymore. So I, I still every day spend good three hours listening, reading, uh, you know, just uh, uh, journals and um, because textbooks I cannot rely on. So that's the, my major part of my own work. And then I help people uh, because they know I have like a bird's eye view of who is saying what, because all these different experts, they have their own pet view, you know, uh, pet peeve, I guess. And um, uh, you cannot just listen to one guy, because everybody's saying different things. You have to kind of uh, understand, and then you need a background to make a judgment and decide what's good for you or somebody else. Um, I'm trying to kind of understand and, and uh, stay current. That's most important, you know, stay up to date on the information. What Dr. Atkins said five years ago, nobody's talking that, about that anymore, you know, that kind of thing. And there's something was very, everybody's favorite two years ago, now, I'll, you know, fell out of favor. And, so it's, it's very difficult to keep up, but then I'm very happy to you know, spend that time to keep up and then so I can pass on that information to everybody. And uh, people in our area begin to find out that I have that knowledge and bird's eye view of what's happening. So they, have, they come around you know, asking for my advice and... and uh, I stopped charging for my time. So when you, I, I was studying all these uh, new things to me, because I was a traditionally trained mainstream doctor, that's what I was. But then there's another paradigm I discovered, you know, people who uh, have the very holistic approach, it's a preventive medicine. And then um, one of them is attracted me was uh, acupuncture, which I was uh, I had a good knowledge of because my mother, who is a self-taught healer back in Japan, she used to needle me. <laughs> I didn't like it, but then I was the oldest child, you know, sickly boy, and she used to do a terrible thing to me. <laughs> and uh, so uh, acupuncture. To get the license in New York State, I had to take a formal course and then uh, get the license. Just experience will not do. So I had to go to New York Medical College in Westchester, you know, so then I got the certificate and got the license now. So that's, uh, 
more than 10 years ago, and now acupuncture has become very popular, has become much more accepted, and insurance companies try to pay. So that's good, and um, you know, acupuncture does work. Until 1997, people used to poo-poo that. Like, uh, doctors are even saying, oh, that's a Chinese torture, the medieval torture, you know, it doesn't work. But uh, they can't do that anymore. 1997, U.S. government, uh, NIH, uh, published what we call the consensus study, saying acupuncture works for about 100 different things, you know, pain, asthma, and uh, this and that. And so now it's accepted. Many hospitals are uh, using acupuncturists to come in. You know, they have a, a, a privilege to go in and see the patients, you know, that kind of thing. And um, mostly, well, that's just one technique. Most of my work is in uh, lifestyle, diet, vitamins and supplements. You know, that's very important. Um, nowadays, you can really modify the course of your health and your future. You know, it wasn't possible years ago, but now we can do so m There are so many things available. You know, not only just the vitamins, but the hormones and the enzymes, and, and uh, uh, that will help you. Lifestyle, of course, is important. Uh, like uh, people, you know, exercise, just try to lose weight. But that's not the uh, best way to lose weight. You know, it's a lot of health benefit from, uh, you know, exercise. Uh, something very interesting and then uh, reported more recently is that uh, the more exercise you do, more new brain cells come out, are born. So, we used to, uh, uh, in the medical school, we were taught you have so many number of brain cells, brain uh, nerve cells, and you never get new one. But now we know even person over 80 or 90, uh, if they exercise, walk and run, they can create the new brain cells. You know, therefore you can prevent Alzheimer, you know, Parkinson's and all that. So. Exercise is important to keep muscle in tone and your body in good shape, not necessarily to lose weight. The losing weight, the best way is to eat, le eat less. No diet works, okay? I studied all the diets, Dr. Atkins and Zone, South Beach and Hampton diet. Unless you really strictly adhere to that, you know, we are all human, we sleep and you know, it doesn't work. So. The uh, main thing is that if you eat 90% of what you plan to eat, 10% less, that's my 10% rule, you won't suffer too much because the difference between 90 and 100 is not that much. So you will not feel hungry, you see. So 90%, so you're eating 10% less, you will lose weight because you know not going in as much as you're spending. So, um, lifestyle, of course, uh, diet, uh, you know, I tell patients to stay away from certain food, especially processed food. Uh, carbs uh, are basically the enemy of uh, <laughs> this uh, civilized world, uh, especially white f food of any kind, white bread, white rice, uh, white sugar, you know, there. So, that is a diet and of course the vitamins um, uh, the some will become very important like a vitamin D you know we have been in our camp uh, alternative medicine we have been saying for the last 10 years you have to have a good level of vitamin D but uh, regular doctors didn't pay attention until a few years ago there's so much pressure from public they listen to the radio you know and um, there's so many studies come out about the vitamin D level, so they started to ask doctors. Now doctors uh, have to take the test of vitamin D level, and they are the one now giving patients, which is very good. And vitamin D is so important. It's not only vitamin; it's actually a hormone too. So you know, that's just one example. Okay, and then of course you know hormone replacement therapy for women. You know, when the uh, uh, pre-menopause and menopause hit, 
they can take the hormone replacement. And the men, we need an equal time, equal opportunity, and the testosterone cream, and a few other things. So these are the things that um, can make a huge difference in somebody's life. Yes. Calcium used to be much more important, but now we feel it's a little overrated because calcium, if you take a blood test, it shows where your calcium level is. So you do have calcium in your body, okay? If you take too much, what happens, some of the excess calcium, unfortunately, goes into your blood vessels and then, you know, making your blood vessels a little too tight and uh, clog, clog it up. So we used to say take about 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day, but now we're down to about 800. Many people don't know that yet, uh, especially doctors. That is, you know, they take about 10 years for them to learn anything new. So that's calcium. Actually, uh, we used to say, or if you want to prevent cold, or if you start to catch cold, take cal uh, oh no, that's vitamin C. I'm sorry. Uh, the calcium and uh, you need vitamin D. Vitamin D will channel the calcium into the right direction, push it into the uh, uh, more the bones rather than to the artery. You see, so they all interact with each other. You know, you can't just take one and then try to get the benefit from that. But then there's always this uh, very multifaceted biochemical reaction take place in the body and uh, it's very complicated. Calcium, I think a lot of food do contain, and uh, some may not even need calcium supplement, supplementation. And uh, of course, uh, some people drink milk, which I have a little doubt because uh, after all, milk is for calf, you know, for baby cows. And 80% uh, of Americans, I believe, we are lactose in intolerant. So if, for example, if I drink milk, you know, I, I have diarrhea, that's so I, I don't drink. But then I think we tend to uh, keep drinking, keep pushing that to your children, and then they become desensitized. So, you know, they can tolerate, but then it's not the right thing. But anyway, uh, milk is a big source of calcium in this country anyway. And also a leafy vegetable and uh, uh, meat, which, uh, you know, got the bad rap, uh, you know, years ago. But um, people were saying, but still they're saying, don't eat saturated fat. Saturated fat is bad. That's not true. And uh, unfortunately, this big paper came out 60 years ago from Framingham, Massachusetts. Said, so don't stay away from the meat and butter. And then that's when a uh, company like Kellogg said, eat our cereal, don't touch the meat, you know. But that's when Americans start to gain weight, you see, the carbohydrate. So carbohydrate is, uh, is a real poison. You know, of course, the sugar and the uh, salt is the, uh, the worst poison uh, in, in the food area, but um, carbs, you know, is, is what happens when you eat too much carbs go into your bloodstream and becomes uh, triglyceride, which is a fl free floating fat, and that's the one become cholesterol. But the cholesterol is something we do need to eat because your brain is made of cholesterol and your hormones male or female hormones, they are made out of cholesterol. So cholesterol is, is important that we eat. Well, um, I was trained as a pathologist. Okay, I went to the best uh, institution, Columbia Presbyterian, and in my career, as a pathologist, I must have done about 4,000 autopsies. So when I look at people, I can already see inside, <laughs> heart and lungs. And, and uh, so I know a lot about diseases, 
all the cancers and you know inf infection, and I think I know how people live, how they die. So I know enough the diseases and medicine, and then of course when I hit 50, you know I started to have this arthritis, and I wanted to find out any way to prevent and also get younger and healthier, which you know anti-aging medicine. I was very interested. And I think it came easier to me than to many, maybe other doctors because I am from Japan where Eastern medicine is practiced also, especially my mother. She was a self-taught healer and uh, she did acupuncture on me and I had to eat uh, terrible herbs and sometimes, you know. And once she did a terrible thing, she took me to a snake guy and um, this guy sells snake meat and then one day, I, I went there, I must have been sick, six or seven years old. The guy cut the uh, snake head and uh, pulled it upside down, all the blood drips into the cup. I had to drink it. <laughs> I still have that taste, you know, such a bad memory. And uh, whatever that was for, you know, uh, at least I survived. So that kind of thing, and uh, I didn't like anything extreme. But, um, and then taking the acupuncture course and understanding uh, the difference between Eastern and the Western culture, that I think helped me to go in. And also, first 50 years, you know, most people are gonna, uh, many people are gonna live until 100 now, because as we speak right now, more than 75,000 Americans are over 100. That means somebody is reaching that age. I know personally four people in my uh, village, you know, they are uh, over 100. Three are in the nursing home, one is uh, 103 and he's still mentally and physically okay, my wife's friend. So, uh, the, uh, all this, the uh, idea of having the first half, 50 years, it's very easy. You could stay up all night and the next day you're okay. But the second half, you know, second half, you really have to start paying attention. You know, we are like old cars and everything starts falling apart. So you have to repair this one, you have to repair that one, <laughs> and you go on. And then you try to stay away from prescription medication and then uh, eat well, then somehow you keep pushing the um, inevitable and also the real suffering to the last week or two, or maybe nothing. So that's the main goal of uh, everybody after a certain age. So that's when I started to study more, and now uh, I'm helping other people to do what I have done in the last 25 years. Yes. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, acupuncture came, now there's so many things about the uh, hormone. You know, women, there was a controversy about hormone replacement. Women, estrogen, the progesterone was went up and down and now back a little bit, you know, they're using it more legitimately. And the men, we have testosterone cream. And uh, I personally use it and uh, uh, that's a tremendous anti-aging, you know. And uh, we do need testosterone. It's very important for your brain function, and uh, the people who have a higher testosterone level, uh, they have fewer incidences of Alzheimer and uh, uh, cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive problems. And then, uh, uh, of course, other vitamin levels such as vitamin D, if you have a higher de level of D, uh, often you live longer and uh, prevents uh, breast cancer for women, the colon cancer, and then prostate cancer for men. And then there are so many other benefits come out of just one vitamin, because they work together with other vitamins also. So understanding that and then doing the uh, minimum required every day will make a huge difference. Yeah. Someone's afraid to go to doctors. What might you tell them? Well, I, I do understand. I stay away from doctors and the hospitals especially. 
you know hospitals are very dangerous place to be. You know, only when you break your legs uh, in appendicitis, you know, you need surgery. That's when you have to go in. But uh, any other time, I think you should try to stay away, because um, leading cause of death in this country is by medicine. Doctors, hospitals, the nurses, technicians, and and we really do harm to each other. And um, something like 750,000 people we kill, you know, medical profession kill every year, uh, not intentionally, but we make mistakes. Everybody m makes mistakes. You know, we are such an imperfect <laughs> being. And um, there's a such thing as a hospital acquired infection. That kills, I think, about 150. Uh, thousand people in the hospital, you know, uh, hospital is a very dirty place, has all kinds of uh, bacteria and uh, undesirable uh, uh, microorganisms are there and then you catch them and you often die because uh, many of them are uh, antibiotic resistant, you know, antibiotic doesn't work. And then we kill another about the same number, 100, 150,000, by prescription medication. We make a mistake, either wrong patient, or wrong amount, or doctor's handwritten was so bad, couldn't read, you know, all that. And then, of course, there are many other uh, causes, but those are the two major causes, you know. Yeah, because you have to kind of, after a certain age, okay, maybe after up to 50, you're okay. After that, you really have to start looking after yourself, taking care of yourself by lifestyle, diet, and vitamins and supplements are vital. And you try to stay away from prescription medication. If you are given something uh, that you need, then you try to win off by doing the right thing. Like uh, obesity, as you know, is uh, one of the worst problems we have in this country, and that leads to pre-diabetes, diabetes, and, and uh, also uh, brain problems, and uh, loss of memory, cognitive ability, and, and uh, you know, you are kind of rushing yourself to the uh, graveyard, you know, which you don't want to do. Obesity takes about 10 to 15 years out of a person's life and smoking about seven to ten years. You know, we are very self-destructive if you think of it. Why should you smoke? You know, we of course smokers uh, uh, have all kinds of problems. Also second-hand smoking, as you know. You know, if a husband smokes, then often wife can get the, uh, lung cancer too. And now we're talking about third-hand smoking. Third-hand smoking is uh, when you smoke, that smell gets into your clothes. Even if you're not smoking, that smell, smell is actually a particle in, in the air, and that's what you are you know, breathing in, and that can cause problems too. So uh, there's so many things, the lifestyle you know, can be changed, and um, after all, you, you really want to live healthy you know, without uh, kind of uh, disability or uh, urinary incontinence. incontinence. <laughs> well, um, as you know, uh, Hippocrates or somebody said, first to do no harm. Unfortunately, traditional or mainstream medicine, we often cause harm, and uh, not, of course, intentionally. After studying pathology, doing all kinds of autopsies and seeing the diseases, how people die, um, in the traditional medicine, we are into damage control. Doctors say, you get sick, come to me, and I'll help you. This whole medical economics is wrong. You know, I think so many uh, people should be assigned to each doctor, let's say 2,000 people per doctor or something. And then 
doctor should be paid according to how many of that 2,000 are healthy. The healthier people, more healthy people you have, the more money doctors should make. That's the way it should be. Then doctors have a strong incentive to keep you healthy, right? There's some countries like that in the, in, in, in the world, uh, including some parts of China, I understand, and uh, almost like a prepaid medicine, you pay so much a year, and then uh, if you get sick, you get fixed, but uh, the more healthy population doctor has, he should make more money. Not when you, know, you get sick and come to him and fix you. So doctors have no incentive keeping you healthy. If they keep you healthy, then he has no business. His kids don't go to college. No, that's not good, you see. But that's how it is. So, uh, of course, nobody is talking loud about that. You know, we're kind of uh, keeping it quiet. So I noticed that while I was doing all these uh, studies, uh, research, and autopsies, you know, so when I became interested in alternative medicine, I started to study how to keep improve your health, keep healthy, to stay away from any prescription medication or surgery. Mainstream doctors have two things in arsenal. One is medicine, drugs. The other one is surgery. Okay, those two. Uh, now they're beginning to realize maybe they have to uh, go into a little more preventive side, you know, but then they're not, they're not, they don't have that strong, strong incentive to do that. So that's where we come in, alternative doctors, you know, trying to educate people, you know, you don't need uh, this medicine for hypertension. If you lose a little weight, stay a little active, you can get off, you know. And actually, personally, I did that. I, my uh, blood pressure became high, even though I was doing the right thing. So I talked to a friend of mine, and he put me on the Altase, which is uh, one medication. And I stayed on it for a year. And then I started to exercise a little more and eat less. Now I'm off medication. You know, I don't need it anymore. So, uh, so I have no prescription medication, and uh, that if people follow that, if they're willing to do that, and I think we can all become very healthy, you know, the healthy nation. Well, healthy lifestyle, as you know, it's a lifestyle itself, and then diet, and then, uh, of course, the vitamins and supplements. But uh, the mind over body is so important, you know. I think many people suffer from very stressful life. And every stress, when the, you have a stress, there's a hormone called cortisol comes out of your adrenal gland. That's right above the kidney. And that's very uh, uh, counterproductive, whatever you want to do. So uh, we really want to learn how to de-stress yourself or avoid any stress situation that you get into. Um, but uh, exercise is very good. Uh, for example, uh, there was a big study done on the 10,000 people. They all have a uh, depression problem. They divided into half. One group of 5,000 people had an uh, antidepressant called a Zoloft which is strong medication, and the other 5,000, no medication, just exercise. Psychiatrists even went running with them, you know, that kind of thing. So they studied for a few years, and this me no medication group totally outperformed, outdid the uh, antidepressant group. So you see how important this uh, exercise is to relieve your tension or stress, you know, and also good for every part of your body, you know, and uh, new brain cells will come out, and obviously it's good for cardiovascular in, uh, status. So that's just one example. Well, I do run, uh, like yesterday I ran three miles right here on, along the Hudson River. It's a beautiful day, but then uh, I, 
cross train. I I uh, mix. Uh, usually, I sp go to a uh, gym for one hour, you know, regardless of uh, weather, you know, rain or shine. So I go in, first half an hour is a resistance work, you know, iron pumping or they have all this cyber machine and you do. And then the last half, second half an hour is uh, cardiovascular because then I can get wet and take a shower and go home. So I used to do just straight running for half an hour. But uh, now I'm 76, I'm trying to mix with the uh, elliptical, 10 minutes, and then Stairmaster, 10 minutes, and then uh, treadmill, uh, 10 minutes. You know, that's probably just right for me. I used to play, and having my own tennis court, you know, that was a big pastime, but um, I abused my right shoulder. Uh, after many years of playing tennis and also skiing, falling, <laughs> on skiing with a stretched arm. So I had to have a rota rotator cuff surgery. So tennis, after so many years of playing, I have my own tennis court maybe over 40 years now. It's not good exercise. You abuse few parts of your body. While running or swimming, swimming probably the best. And the running is good too. And uh, in half an hour, you get enough exercise. See, and you're happy. Tennis, you need another person, good weather, and then you need good hour, if not an hour and a half, you know, with the singles to play. Uh, it's time is limited, you know, it's difficult. So <clears throat> I do running, and um, uh, this Stairmaster is probably the hardest cardiovascular uh, exercise machine, but that's good. And um, uh, exercise and uh, now the top experts are recommending uh, everybody should have about 10,000 uh, steps a day and uh, if you count every time you move and they even have a little meter that you can put around your arm or something and the 10,000 steps a day is not that difficult you know you are moving you know going to the refrigerator you're going to something so I think it's even fidgeting, even any kind of moving, I think is good. Just couch potato is not good though. Well, 50 is the half, half time, right? You're half dead. So it's not too late to start living healthy at age 50, I think. However, of course, it's better if you start at an earlier age, you know, uh, no smoking, for example, right? And no gaining weight too much. And, and if you have an active life, definitely easier to go into the second half, you know, second half time. But then it's not too late, you know. I see uh, a lot of people who are already 60, 70, and they come to me because you know, especially men, uh, we are not very open. The women, you know, they're very open. You know, they all, they can vent to each other. You know, they talk about it. So m most of my uh, clients or patients, they are women over 40. You know, they are the ones uh, express themselves. The men kind of have to be half dead before they <laughs> seek doctor's advice. But anyway, you know, there are more and more health conscious people. I think partly because of all this uh, radio program and doctor, doctor's program on the television, the Dr. Oz, and you know, and I think they're good, you know, helping. So um, it's, it would be better, of course, if you start earlier, even at age 20 or 30. But it's not necessary, I think, you know. It just make it a little more difficult. What happened is uh, in the last few years, one Jehovah's Witness came and she was happy with the results, you know. She told all her, they call brothers and sisters, the whole congregation descended on me. <laughs> and they're nice people. And then uh, now uh, my grandchildren go to this uh, horse uh, academy or 
the horse farm in the riding in where we live, uh, about half an hour north of Manhattan, and then uh, the, the horse rider, the riding teacher, uh, had a little problem with the foot. And I did acupuncture, she got better miraculously after two treatments. So she told everybody, you know, with the riders and then their kids, and so the whole bunch of them started to come. <laughs> so that's what happened, the words of mouth. You know, of course, I don't advertise, and um, uh, so I think words of mouth, is, it's amazing how fast the, uh, that kind of word spread. You know, I didn't realize, but that's how it is. Actually, this country, of course, uh, many of uh, uh, ancestors came from Europe. Europe is uh, way ahead of us in uh, naturopathic medicine and nutritional medicine, and also um, uh, homeopathy. And uh, there's a medical school in Philadelphia, uh, Hahnemann, that was a homeopathic medical school, but now it's a regular medical school. But then a couple of naturopathic med medical schools, excellent one, especially in the West Coast, uh, Oregon and Washington State, they have a wonderful place. You know, they learn basically almost similar uh, medical uh, science, but more emphasis on nutrition. And uh, unfortunately, New York State doesn't allow NUD, naturopathic doctor, to uh, hang up the... Uh, 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 or to uh, open the business here. At Connecticut, you can, and uh, that kind of thing. But I think that's it's spreading more, you know, people more accepting, because they're helping more than regular doctors. <laughs> yes. So 100 years ago, I'm sorry, yeah, this country was doing very well on the naturopathic and the homeopathic medicine, and uh, they, they had a very strong voice among the American Medical Association, but then this a young, uh, aggressive scientists came up, and they're the ones that, you know, you're, you're the quackery and this and that. And then that is, uh, was very strong until maybe 20 years ago or so, but again, ND and homeopathic uh, is kind of surging, coming up. Yeah. I see already the fusion fusion of the uh, traditional medicine and the preventive medicine. And that's the, the fusion of East and West. That's what it is. You know, we say alternative medicine, but 80% of the, uh, the rest of the world, 80% of the world, alternative medicine to them is the main medicine. You know, they don't use high-tech uh, uh, medicine. And uh, there's a difference between this country and Canada. Uh, our medical standards are pretty same each. But we have many more MRI, many more bypass machines in this country than Canada, and the outcome, the prognosis is the same, you see. So we do, we overdo things. We in, intervene too quickly, you know. So not nece necessarily improving the outcome, yeah. So we spend millions of dollars, but then we're not getting the results. There's a book uh, titled The uh, Power of Two Weeks. Power of Two Weeks. And I agree, the main theme of that book is that uh, if anything happens, you know, uh, something breaks and you have pain, wait two weeks. Very often things take care of itself. And I learned that our dog, you know, started to suffer, like a, you know, die or something. And I told my wife, wait two weeks. Ten days later, this uh, little uh, dog back to normal. But then uh, for about 10 days, she was dying, you know? <laughs> and uh, I almost in, you know, intervened and do something, but then I said, ah, two, power of two weeks, power of two weeks, and you see that what, what happens. So if you have some stomach ache or headache or something, just wait a little bit, you know? If a uh, brain tumor or the stroke or something, you will know that something's serious. But if not, 
often, you know, they go away. Actually, it happened to me, uh, I had a stomachache uh, last week for like a few days. You know, I, I was thinking you know, about or what to do. To them. But then I said, okay, power of two weeks. Like uh, four days later, it's gone and now I'm okay. You know, that's just one example. But the, so many things like that, whether it comes from stress or any other reason, or something happened there, you know, but then uh, time heals all wounds, which is true. <laughs> and um, uh, human body is an amazing machine. You know, we have such a he strong healing power, and if we do things too quickly, you know, you get too far ahead of it, and that's not good. Right, often, yeah, that's what the, uh, happens very often in the hospital and the doctors, you know, do too quickly. Now, many cancers such as uh, prostate cancer, we do, we overdo things. You know, the guys become impotent and all that for no good reason. Prostate cancer is a very benign kind of disease except one or two percent. You know, they go aggressively, but the rest they don't, you know. And I'm 100 percent sure I have prostate cancer now, microscopically. But then I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to outlive that cancer. So if you are 50, your chance of having prostate cancer is 50%. If you're 70, 70% 70 of the time you have prostate cancer, microscopically. But that doesn't mean that cause problem. You see, there's so many things like that, you know, and then that's why I'm against like a PET scan, the whole body, uh, a study, and if you find some a little spot, what are you going to do? It causes more anxiety, more pain, you know, and you have to do something once something is shown, right? It's better if you don't know it. This TMI, you get too much information, it's not a very good thing, yeah? not necessarily positive. <laughs> when there was a, uh, if, if you remember, gynecologist uh, uh, giving um, hormone replacement, you know, estrogen, progesterone, like a premarin, you may have heard of premarin, it was a very popular uh, hormone that the women are taking. Premarin means pregnant male's urine. That's a horse pee, you know, they were able to patent that as a hormone. So they used that, and then the breast cancer increased, the heart disease, and so it became very controversial. So in my experience, and then I had a female patient, I switched patient from this chemical and synthetic to more natural, uh, come from plants and herbs, and then um, she was happy, but then this doctor called me, irate. What did you do to my, do to my patient? <laughs> And that's a quackery kind of thing, you see? And this is good 15 years ago. But now they wouldn't dare say that because now we become controversy and, you know, causing cancer and, and heart disease. So things like that. Uh, but um, uh, the reception, I think it's changing for the better. Yeah, uh, look at the vitamin D level, you know, they weren't paying attention until a few years ago, but now, you know, they're doing it and uh, they're beginning to understand minds over body, you know. So, but then they're still not recommending yoga or uh, meditation, uh, which uh, uh, many people don't have that half an hour in a dark room lying down and all that. So I recommend what we call square breathing or box breathing, uh, yoga people call. It's uh, only two minutes technique and uh, you inhale on the count of certain number, three, four, five, and then you hold your breath on the count of same number, and then exhale to the count of same number, and then hold your breath to the count of same number. That's why it's called square or box. And you do that for two minutes. You put yourself in very calm uh, uh, mind, and then you head becomes very clear, you know, you can think clearly. 
So I recommend that square breathing to do that for two minutes or so if you have to interview somebody you know nasty or if you have to see or talk to your boss, you know, you're afraid. And uh, <clears throat> there are two kinds of nerve system in your body. One is uh, if you are pinch you, you have pain. That's one kind of nerve. The other one is called autonomic nerve system. That's come from brain, goes through the spine, and they control your emotion. So uh, there's a two phases in that uh, autonomic nerve system. One is called sympathetic phase. The other one is called parasympathetic phase. Sympathetic phase is a fight or flight. You sweat, nervous, tense, you know, and then you, like a pit bull is coming after you. You have to run faster or face and beat the beast, you know. If not, you get bitten. So you get into sympathetic phase if you have somebody nasty that you have to deal with, you know, or your kids and uh, parents and this. And then so you want to put yourself into parasympathetic phase. That's when you become calm and you have your head cleared, and you can do it only two minutes. Yoga may take half an hour, but two minutes, just sit down. Uh, standing will be difficult, sitting down or lying down, and then you, take, you do a abdominal deep breathing. You push your diaphragm down as you breathe in, and then so abdomen protrudes when you're inhaling. You're counting, one, two, three, four, no thought comes into your head. See, that's very important, you're counting. You don't have to say it, but you're counting in your head. And then you hold your breath there, you know, again counting, one, two, three, four, five. And then exhale, push all the dirty air out, counting again. And then there you stop breathing for four or to the same count of number. And then it's a deep breathing a uh, normal person breathes about 14 times a, a minute. But this one is deep breathing, so you can do maybe only four or five a minute. So if you do that for two minutes, you start feeling this euphoric, you know, nice calm feeling, and then you can face any situation, you know, somebody nasty, and then you're already calm, and then what can I do? <laughs> So I think that's very good, very practical. As a matter of fact, last night I had trouble falling asleep. And then I was lying down in the dark room. I said, okay, I'm going to do square breathing. I started to do it. I remember first minute. And then, see, I must have fallen asleep. <laughs> so it works. Unfortunately, because of HMO and the managed care and all these insurance companies, doctors have to see so many more patients now to make the same amount of money. So typically, American doctors spend, I think, about seven minutes uh, per patient. And then, of course, they spend uh, time with the nurses or maybe physician's assistant or something before the patient gets to the doctor. But still, there's no doctor-personal relationship we used to have, you know, that nice relationship, no more. So what I'm doing is uh, when new patient comes, we sit down in my living room, basically, you know, sitting down face to face. I spend at least an hour, if not an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, talking about everything. Because after so many, so much time, a lot of new information come out. It will never come out in 10 minutes, you know. So, and then I write down, and then if I can suggest something to do, you know, a certain diet, or, and I recommend certain things, you know, do this and do that. So I think they're very happy, and then they're surprised that I'm willing to spend that kind of time. But that session, I think, is very important. You know, that in itself is very healing, you know, listening, and then and also my talking, and I have this, uh, you know, dialogue and conversation. And without that, you know, we used to have that kind of doctor-patient relationship no more, right? 
and uh, it's very now it's just doc, uh, patients look at the doctors uh, uh, like a malpractice uh, suitcase. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's very important for doctors to spend time and listening. Listening, listening is very important. Well, unfortunately, doctors don't have time to spend like three hours like I do to learn a new, you know, in the preventive medicine. So that's out. But then they are using nurse practitioner, physician's assistant. They are more willing to learn, you know, this. And then maybe they can uh, spend time with the patients and talk about, you know, what the herbs and the vitamins, you know, they should be taking and that kind of thing. But um, uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's going to be very difficult, especially with this new Obama case coming. Uh, you know, he wants uh, everybody to be insured and there's going to be a huge shortage of doctors. Now it's going to be three minutes instead of seven minutes. That's it. Right now we have about 30 million people who are uninsured, but he's trying to ins have everybody insured. That means uh, you know they can go to the doctors. Right now they're avoiding uh, hospitals and doctors because they can't afford. But then we need more doctors. Right now we have a shortage already, you know. So if you're looking for a job, if you look for a job in the healthcare, you find something. But I don't know what will happen though. It, it's the future is not very bright. I think what's happening is more NUD, naturopathic doctor, and the chiropractors also getting into the bandwagon, and uh, some physicians assistant and you know uh, nurse practitioner learning this and uh, like a TV program, Dr. Oz and uh, Doctor's program, I think they're good. Sometimes they're giving wrong information. I catch them, especially uh, Dr. Oz had this uh, uh, guest, I forgot the dermatologist or something, but she was giving a wrong information. Her information that she was giving was good seven, eight years old. You know, she's not up to yesterday. That's why you know, we fall behind and uh, they don't have time to keep up, you know. But uh, still, what they are showing, a good 90% is good, you know, so doc uh, people are becoming aware. And they are the one asking doctors, what about my vitamin D level? And now <laughs> doctors have to uh, test, you know, they have to take that, you see. So uh, overall, I think I think it's, it's good, you know, what's happening, slowly. Yeah. Well, that's the traditionalist, you know, uh, mainstream doctors, and uh, they say, oh, where is the scientific uh, evidence that this helps, you know, that kind of attitude. And uh, they may say so, but they, behind the uh, scene, they may be taking vitamin D pills because, you know, they begin to understand. But uh, still, there's a lot of resistance from uh, regular doctors. Twenty years ago, somebody had an interview at Harvard Medical School to try to get into uh, their research or something. And the president of Harvard Medical School said that nutrition has no place in uh, health, something like that. It's only 20 years ago, but you see things you know, turned very quickly. And a lot of good reports come out of Harvard now, especially public health. You know, they do a statistic uh, study and then uh, something work, and then they report it. So uh, things, I think, you know, rapidly changing.
Well, uh, the insurance company had a lot of problems, as you know, but um, uh, I think they begin to understand uh, whether they act on it or not is different. But uh, they are happy to pay for your uh, bypass surgery, which is maybe $100,000, if they keep giving you right nutrients, uh, vitamins and supplements, you can, they can keep postponing that eventual event, you know, uh, open heart surgery or something. And th therefore, they can save a lot of money. But uh, bypass surgery, uh, doctors, anesthesiologists, the nurses, and technicians, they are, and the, uh, the machine, uh, machine made by company, they are in cohoots, you see. And um, insurance company also in that group, they are happy to pay $100,000 while they can pay a f maybe a few thousand dollars a year to keep postponing this, you know, then they can save a huge amount of money. But that's not how, you know, their mindset is. But then I think they begin to understand you know, they may be doing the wrong thing, and uh, it's, um, uh, there's a famous article published in the main uh, peer uh, review journal it's called uh, Bypass Team. That's the title of the, uh, uh, this article, written by anesthesiologist. It's in the community hospital, and he was telling the truth. He was told by hospital administrator because they bought two million dollar bypass machine that paying the loan, the mortgage, right? So they asked everybody to go look for potential patients, whether they need a bypass or not. See, <laughs> because they have to pay the loan, right? And then the doctors who are trained to do bypass, they need the cases. And then the nurses, technicians, you know, they have to have so many a week to just make it. So this really, you know, <laughs> told the truth. And there was a big up upheaval, of course, you know, doctors are talking about this. But that's true. That's what happens. And uh, uh, if they can really act on this money saving and they understand uh, all this good uh, prevention, with the vitamins and the lifestyle diet work. And if we can eliminate the bypass, it's wonderful. But if we can just keep pushing, postponing, you know, even with that, you can save a lot of money. Oxford is the first one to start paying for acupuncture. Yeah, they remember. I think Medicare hasn't yet, although government said acupuncture work. But then the many other companies follow the suit, you know, which is good. And then uh, I think uh, Oxford is also start to pay for some vitamins and supplements. You know, they should be, you know, they can. There's a study showed if all, every American over age 60 takes one multivitamin a day, uh, saves about $75 billion a year, you know, preventing all unnecessary surgery and all that. And I, I, I think that's true, you know. So we're talking about a huge amount of money. This came out about uh, 10 years ago. Actually, I heard on the radio, and it's a very reliable source that uh, he was quoting that study. The problem is they're in cohoots with the doctors and hospitals, and you know, they're the part of the gang. You see, so it will be very difficult to undo all these connections and uh, network. So uh, they have a strong will to de depart from that and then start paying for the nutrients and so patients don't need high-tech expensive uh, surgery and procedures, you know. Well, in a small country, that would be much easier. You know, if the government says, you know, uh, uh, pay for the vitamins, but then uh, postpone the surgery, that can happen. But uh, in this country, I think resistance is so strong. Uh, uh, and then now they're talking about the socialized medicine, which <laughs> I don't know. My brother-in-law is a doctor in Canada, and uh, government pays them, as you know. 
So like a patient waiting for hip replacement, they have to wait two or three years. So they get impatient and come to this country and pay cash. You know, it's a, a tremendous amount of money. But uh, something like that, uh, Canada, I think, is easier to implement. But in this country, uh, it's going to take a long time, though. So pay, everybody, as in individually, have to act you know, to, to become healthy. Well, the, the, the paper you gave me uh, from, uh, that was a guru of, uh, yoga guru, he said, uh, you know, I, even if you get sick, you stay away from doctor. And <laughs> <clears throat> I think that's important. It says you have to learn about your own condition. You know, you have to become kind of e educated. Maybe it's difficult for some people who cannot, don't have that intelligence. But uh, for most people, you know, I think they're reasonably intelligent to learn, and that the certain things, uh, you know, they shouldn't do. And they hear that all the time: no smoking, don't get fat, don't eat uh, uh, French fried, and you know that kind of thing. So I think words are spreading. Look what's happening to New York City. No more trans fats uh, with Bloomberg, and no more soda vending machine, which is very positive. So I think slowly it's happening, though. You know. It's a youth culture. not good. Uh, things are changing in Japan too, you know. I remember my grandmother had a stroke and my uncle and aunt were looking after her for like a two years after she had a uh, stroke. And uh, like a changing diaper of grown-up is not like a changing baby's diaper, you know. So I, I've seen that and it was difficult. I think now they have a nursing homes and you know it's very much like here. But then I think that's also causing uh, or changing the culture of, uh, you know, whole village used to be together, the uncle and the cousins, they all lived in the same area, but now it's a nuclear family and it's not very good because you lose that uh, uh, the old style togetherness that we, we had. Uh, lately, I, you may have read the newspaper article about uh, something like 350 uh, people, over 100 in Japan, are missing. So they went around look, looking for so and so. I think they're still sending the pension or something. And then they are, one by one, they're finding out because of this uh, uh, breakup, the close family, and they don't talk to each other as much as they used to, and then they don't know where so-and-so uh, so -and -so went, and then keep, lose track. And then uh, Japan still have a uh, highest longevity, but still now this kind of report wasn't very positive, you know. So, um, and, and uh, uh, as we, the young people also, uh, becoming aware, and I have some young people coming to me, and then what they should do, you know. So I think that's good, and then they can age gracefully, and uh, one thing is sure, it's uh, death on taxes, right? There's no exception, you know, as a pathologist, I can tell you, every one of us, you know, we're all mortal, and um, uh, as they say, yesterday's history, Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why we call it present. Yeah? And who knows, you know, after we leave here and then somebody hits you and you're doing the, your right thing, but then you have no control of what other people do to you. And, and then, oh, of course, uh, uh, like a 9-11 happened that you happen to be walking. And, you know. So you really have to enjoy present, but then uh, as you know, most people do live you know, uh, long, and then you really have to 
be prepared for any kind of event. The uh, ancestor worship or elder worship I think is very good, you know. And we used to have uh, a uh, wise man of the village, and everybody went to him for advice, you know, that kind of thing. I'm sure it's dead now. But uh, uh, there's something about the older people with experience, you know, even my, myself, you know, uh, I've been around uh, for 76 years, you know, people talk about the World War II at the beginning, and many young people don't even know. But then, you know, I say something, I was there, you know. <laughs> There's a balance somewhere, you know, between, and uh, uh, it's good to get old healthy. That I can tell you. You be begin to appreciate life, you know, more. Uh, I see many people in my age group, life becomes chore. Every day, just the process of living becomes chore, you know. And, just going to uh, uh, shopping and then you know, get enough food and everything takes longer and, <laughs> and uh, if you have young people living there like uh, olden days you know like a village style living was okay but now you're alone you know just two people in the suburb or something you have to go shopping if you don't you can't drive uh, no food come to you. Wonderful. Uh, my father was born in this wooden house. Have you been to uh, Gasho, the restaurant? It's uh, that building uh, about 40 minutes north of here. It's like uh, 450 years old. But the uh, building my father was born is, I would say, good 350 years old. Everything is wood and uh, paper, bamboo, and there's no nail these days. So everything's tied with a rope, and it's a three story, and the top story, uh, third floor, uh, silk worms used to live, you know, they <laughs> used to make a silk. And the second floor, I don't know what, the, the, the ground floor, everybody slept, and there's a half outhouse at the end of the house, you know. <laughs> and um, so the cousin was living about 100 feet away, and another cousin, and you know, that kind of thing. If you were there, the middle of the day all congregate, and then they talked about and It was such a togetherness, you know. Was, and then if you have like a 20 relatives around there, there are always some you like, some you don't particularly care for. <laughs> so you have a choice, you know. And then that's where my father was born, about the two hours north of where my father and brothers, uh, my father is dead and my two, two brothers practice. And uh, uh, where I was born, it's the south of Tokyo. Also, my mother had uh, brothers and sisters, you know. Those days, uh, no birth control, so my mother is out, one out of seven. My father also had, I guess, five or six siblings. So I have 32 cousins. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I liked some, and some I didn't particularly care for. So that is, was a wonderful, secure feeling, almost like you were in a big boat rather than a small dinghy, you know. Then I think I see uh, people here uh, in our area, half an hour north of Manhattan, and old people, we are aging together. And I see our friends are dying and, and the pancreatic cancer and this and that. And the only two people living together, one have a heart attack and then cannot do anything, the other one has to do. But I see desperate situation in all these people, you know. I don't know, and then they have a, a meals on wheel kind of help, you know, people come in. But uh, I can see as we, the whole population get older, you know, becomes very difficult. But I think it's similar things that be, begin to happen in Japan too. You know, the nuclear family, a lot of uh, village situation is kind of uh, disappearing.
it's sad, but that's how it is. Hopefully, you know, like a, a story that I'm telling, wake up some people and then, you know, they want to uh, do the same thing and follow, and that will make a huge difference in the rest of their life, you know. If they're 50, you know, they have to understand they're half dead, and the other half, they want to make it as comfortable, as, as healthy as possible. And that's possible these days, you know. Yeah, well, as you, we say, minds over body and the spirit is so important. I think we are a spiritual being, you know. Uh, we are not just the food and then the body and the physiology, it's all science. But then uh, what we think and uh, this spirit part is so important. And uh, if you have the right attitude, that alone, you know, will help you very much. So, you know, whatever you do, yoga, meditation, and uh, even uh, any athletic activity, you know, whether you do uh, karate or judo, it doesn't matter, you know, that will really keep you spiritually healthy. And that's be number one before the more body part comes. Yeah, in the last hundred years, I think we have gone in the wrong direction, you know, yeah, it's good to be scientific and if you good to have evidence and so forth. But still, it's such a small part, you know. And uh, this thousand of years, you know, we learned from shaman. Uh, it's a primitive uh, medical person. And uh, like 30-40% uh, of antibi antibiotics come from, or the medicine come from, uh, uh, herbs, you know, which I learned from primitive society. So uh, it's so important that we go back and think the history, not just what happened, especially the last uh, 70, 60 years, you know, and they produced uh, the uh, scientific reports. Without it, it, it's not worth anything. That's not how it is, you know. We, and. Um, Actually, the science is such a small part. Uh, we human uh, you know, bodies, and especially minds, are so amazing. Uh, like uh, every thousand years or so, some genius appear. You know, like a Mozart. He's like a god, you know. You can fake everybody else's music, but not his. And it happens only every thousand years or so. And same with medicine. Uh, this, this guy doesn't have to study something, it's inside, and then the words flow out of their mouth, you know. Like acupuncture too. And we thought this came from China. And then this uh, body called Iceman was found in the Italian Alps. It's about 10 or 15 years ago, it was in newspaper and everything. And then this body was well preserved, so they autopsied. They found the acupuncture points exactly the same as what we use today, 5,000 years old. So we begin to think maybe acupuncture started in Europe with the Marco Polo and all the trade, went to China, that's where it flourished. You know, so we never know, maybe 5,000 years ago, somebody knew you know, where the needles go and somehow that stimulates, send a message to the brain, brain releases chemicals called neurotransmitters, and uh, that's how acupuncture work. But uh, who studied? Who taught him? You know, some kind of genius without studying, you know, already kn knew that. That's what happens. You know? Well, my mother ha never had a real big uh, college education. She just went to domestic economy college, like all the girls, you know, get ready for the marriage and 
uh, learn how to sew and cook, you know, that's all she had. But then she was interested in health. And then uh, she was fascinated with the herbs and she learned it and then she had to use a guinea pig, that was me. I was the oldest kid, you know, so I, I suffered more than all my brothers, you know. So uh, at least she was interested and then I think we ate healthier than other families, other neighbors, I remember. So I think that's good. Well, you know, <clears throat> even there's a people who are uh, professional is a healing touch, you know, just a touching. And Dr. Oz uh, still operates at the Columbia Presbyterian. He has a um, touch, healing touch person on one end, and the other end, I forgot, the, the two alternative uh, health professionals are helping. That's how he operates, with a nice music and aromatherapy. You know, he really started that like 10, 15 years ago, so that's good. So my mother had that healing quality, and uh, he was, she was doing, helping other people too. So if they don't know about this uh, uh, healing quality of people, you know, they poo-poo that, and they say, oh, so it's, it's not scientific, no good. You know, that's what happened last 50, 60 years, you know. But then the beginning to now change a little bit for the better. Well, I think that some countries in the world, uh, they have this uh, almost ideal uh, medical economic system, and including some parts of China, I heard, and uh, it's often prepaid or prepaid by the government. So each doctor uh, uh, has an assignment, on like maybe 5,000 people, you know, they assign so many per doctor. And then, uh, so the doctor looks after them, but then he, the more healthy people you have out of 5,000, more money he makes. So he has all the incentive to keep everybody healthy, you know, recommending vitamins and uh, lifestyle and diets. But then we have just the opposite. We're into damage control. You get sick and come to me. If you're not sick, I'm not interested. You know, I, I can't make money. And that's not good. But then people are not openly talking about it. You know, they're afraid to say anything. But uh, that's how it is though, you know. And um, I think there are some parts in New York uh, where um, uh, Mary Imagine Hospital, where is that? Uh, uh, this community, uh, there's a branch of Columbia Presbyterian Hospital is there. And everybody in town is looked after by this hospital and then they're prepaid. So, a little similar, you know, ideal situation. It has been there for some years now. So there are some exceptions like that, you know. That's right. You're helping each other and uh, informing others, you know. And uh, like a foot doctor in uh, uh, China, they, you know, they walk to the village and then, you know, spread their words, right? So I think also that kind of togetherness uh, culture uh, is part of this, yeah. So now you saw me jumping and playing tennis, running along the Hudson River. And uh, of course, I was very much into youth culture. You know, I felt so young and uh, that time people admiring me, running, you know, in good shape. But now, because of this, I started to look inside uh, my own uh, physical part of, you know, how, how healthy I must be now to live 10 more years. Uh, I could have just died. But um, coming from Japan, uh, we have the culture of uh, uh, respecting elders and their experience, their knowledge. You know, that has become more important at this my age, 79. But uh, from here on, I do more spiritual and uh, uh, 
philosophical things than just uh, uh, giving recommendation to some vitamins or you know, supplements. <laughs> it's not that simple. Yeah. In the mainstream medicine, what we do is normally uh, take care of the symptoms. Uh, that's a damage and the patient comes with the complaints, we'll cure it. Uh, or camouflage with uh, drugs. And uh, that approach I was against for many years. But now I'm taking only one or two uh, prescription medicine and I try not to take any, any, any more un unless it's really necessary. And um, like a taking just a painkiller, maybe remove the pain, but you're not getting down to the root cause of the disease. You know, we want to heal it naturally. And I think in that case, um, uh, alternative medicine definitely will have an advantage over allopathic, it's a so mainstream medicine. Um, but, well, those specialists uh, of course, discussing this every day, you know, and things change. But uh, you know, when when I realized that we know so little about medicine, you know, every illness, everything happens. That hundred pages of uh, information they come, and you have to know. But uh, it's not that simple. You know? um, there's so many aspects we don't understand. We will never know. But um, certainly I'm beginning to kind of uh, look after my own mental, you know, uh, problem that goes with the physical problem. But it is certainly difficult. It's a challenge all your life. So I had the opportunity to try both alternative approach and uh, mainstream medicine on myself, which is uh, the stroke. But uh, there's so, some things you really have to use treatment from both sides. You know, don't shortchange yourself. <laughs> um, so in my case, like a stroke, you, you need uh, to keep the blood pressure at a certain level. So Maybe you have to take a, a blood pressure medicine, and um, if anything else, you know you may need that too. But in my case, I don't need any more. Some people take a, a clot bas busting medicine too. If you have a clot, then you know. Uh, so I, from my perspective, I would say combination of both type of medicine medicine is good <clears throat> but uh, of course very often both are hostile to each other so <laughs> what is the vision of honoring our elders lives well lived well let's look at society it's a youth culture the sense of that's old. It's not valuable. It's not relevant. The sense that if it's not fast and quick, it's not worth anything. Lives Well Lived is about value. It's about valuing those that came before us. It's the acknowledgement of the ancient or the elder, American Indian. It's the earth, the respect for the earth, those who came before you. In our society, it seems that we're always trying to put a facelift on it, tighten it up. Now don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with tightening things up. Because as we get older, we learn as we get older, we mature, and we tighten up our act. You see, 
we have to get back to that village square mentality. This program is important. It's important because if other countries and cultures want to emulate America, we hope that this program could spark some kind of reevaluation, some type of a new look at who we are, who we are as a society. Because there's that, that old saying about it takes a village. Well, it does. I know about the nuclear family. I understand that. But it's more than just a nuclear family. It's the village. In fact, it's the village square. Speaking of village squares, when we started this project, we opened up a Facebook page. And we couldn't believe, we couldn't believe the responses. Responses from, from, from health organizations or elders, elders groups, like elder care and um, veterans groups, all interested in the same thing that we are. This sense of, we want to take back something that we lost. In other cultures, cultures that are based on this sense of respect and honoring of the elders, we're seeing that there's a loss, a loss of value even in those societies. In this program, we hope, we sincerely hope, that we can kind of undo some of the damage that's been done. And if we can, we can start setting new examples. This youth culture, we can't live that way. No society is based on the youth alone. Don't get me wrong. The kids are important. The children's the future. And I'm not making light of that. But it's got to be a balance. We've got to have both ends of the spectrum. The children who look up to the elders and then become the elders. Until next time, I'm Horace Scott. One thing is sure, it's uh, death on taxes, right? There's no exception. You know, as a pathologist, I can tell you, every one of us, you know, we're all mortal. And um, uh, as they say, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. That's why we call it present, yeah? And who knows, you know, after we leave here and then somebody hits you and you're doing the, your right thing, but then you have no control of what other people do to you and and then oh of course uh, uh, like a 9-11 happened that you happen to be walking and you know. so you really have to enjoy present but then uh, as you know most people do live you know, uh, long and then you really have to be prepared for any kind of event <laughs>